Paris Perspective. In this edition of Paris Perspective, we look into the ongoing polemic of energy transition, the future of France's atomic energy grid, and how the old bogeyman of nuclear energy is being eco-washed, as President Macron extols the virtues of a nuclear renaissance and a 60 billion euro investment in the sector. Now, this all comes at a time when the world needs to embrace renewables while bearing the brunt of a global energy crisis, catalyzed, of course, by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the European struggle to wean itself off Moscow's gas. Now, today, I'm joined in studio by Yves Marignac, who's an award-winning nuclear safety expert and head of the Nuclear and Fossil Energies Unit of the Negawatt Institute. Yves, you're very welcome to Paris Perspective today. Hello. Now, let's first and foremost, tell us about Negawatt. Well, Negawatt is a group of experts that has started working more than 20 years ago and, uh, well, got some success mm -hmm. in the French uh, energy debate uh, through uh, the uh, regular uh, publication of uh, energy transition scenarios mm -hmm. uh, and proposals for uh, policies and measures. And uh, uh, the, our uh, approach is based really on a, on a, on a very uh, kind of consistent step-by-step um, -step change in the uh, energy system, which starts with uh, what we call energy sufficiency. Yes. That about energy services, you know, dealing with the uh, size, the uh, nature, the uh, priorities in what we cook, travels we do, how, m how many square meters of, uh, of uh, surfaces we have and so on. Yeah. Uh, then efficiency, which is about, you know, uh, improving uh, technologies to reduce energy losses mm -hmm. all, uh, all around. And then uh, a priority to renewables, because we think that on the long term, renewables, because they are based on natural flows and not exhausting uh, uh, geological stocks, are intrinsically more uh, sustainable yeah. than fossil fuels because of climate change and nuclear power because of its risks. And I mean, this is all a very, um, well, a very political uh, debate. In, and that indeed, uh, you've been a key player in guiding this public debate uh, on energy transition here in France. Now, as France is the second biggest producer of nuclear energy in the world after the United States, of course, the big feather in the cap of the French administration is COP21. How is France actually doing? Uh, not that well. Mm. Um, and but first of first of all, I want to emphasize how political it needs to be. Yeah. Uh, because if we change anything in the energy system, uh, because the energy system is framing our economy, is framing our lifestyles, then we change things that have to be discussed uh, politically. Um, France is kind of sitting on the uh, uh, asset of a low uh, power, uh, sorry, a, a low level of carbon mm -hmm. uh, in uh, its, uh, uh, its really electric it's power, yeah, electric yeah. system. Um, and because it's, uh, it stands at a lower level of uh, emissions than uh, uh, other countries, uh, I mean, it, it, it seems to reduce the pressure on the need to further decrease emissions because we are far from uh, the uh, level we should be. Uh, we are far from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, getting to carbon neutrality, uh, zero emissions uh, by 2050. So, I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, nuclear in heritage um, seems to work somehow like uh, uh, a lock-in. Mm to further changes, a lock-in to further implementation of sufficiency, a lock-in to uh, strong development of renewables. I mean, just to, to information, I mean, by, 20, sorry, by 2020, mm. France was the only country in the European Union, including uh, the United Kingdom, that had oh, that taken stage, objectives yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the share of renewables in final energy consumption. France was the only country in the European Union to miss its own objective of development of renewables. And when it comes to sufficiency, I mean, we, we, I mean the government really changed its mind last year due to the uh, energy crisis, but no, no, no longer than two years ago, uh, the French President Macron was comparing energy sufficiency to the Amish society uh, just to uh, discard any 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 policy of that kind so, so yeah we we really need 
to change the framework, change the way we uh, think energy policy and the kind of addiction to nuclear power that has framed energy policy uh, for long is still there. And uh, yeah. And that, I mean, you, you, it's very interesting there that you're saying that uh, President Macron was almost mocking uh, energy transition, saying you're going to be like the Amish. But indeed, uh, when he was on the campaign trail this time last year um, in Belfort, which is uh, in western, sorry, in eastern France, um, old coal mining areas, um, Macron promised a nuclear renaissance, six new reactors, the rolling out of these small SMR type reactors, and extending the lifespan of the existing reactors, of which there are 56 and various levels of repair and all that. So this was a big political statement. But what exactly is he talking about when we see these three projects that he's putting out there and rolling them out for 60 billion euro of investment? Yeah. Um, well, 60 billion is only for the new EPR reactors. I mean, you have to Look add at the other on top well. of that the cost of life extension mm -hmm. and the cost of uh, potential other reactors like SMRs. Um, <clears throat> what is what is uh, striking uh, with uh, with this speech, with, which was not a candidate speech, mm. I mean it was an official speech as, as incumbent as president, an incumbent president, which turned its back to its promises from the previous uh, campaign, when he said he would stick to the objective of reducing uh, French dependency on uh, on nuclear power. Um, to, well, first of all, it's interesting to note that this speech was uh, took place just a few days before the uh, invasion of Ukraine, which obviously completely changed uh, our energy landscape. And uh, it's really striking that there's no um, no um, uh, no no change in the plan to take into account this return of experience. And on the contrary, I mean the the the. the the, the, this winter, although the uh, I mean the energy crisis is uh, uh, is uh, uh, more acute in France because of the uh, failure of the uh, nuclear fleet and the tenth winter late of the uh, EPR being built in Flamanville. Mm -hmm. I mean the conclusion that is driven from that is that we need more yeah. nuclear power and not less, which is. Uh, kind of paradoxic, and um, the industry is in in such a bad shape that the uh, chair of uh, the uh, French Safety Authority said it can't meet the objectives set by the president in a safe way without a Marshall Plan. So we are we are faced with the evidence of a kind of failure from an energetic energetic point of view and an industrial point of view, but. The decision is that we need more, and that is what uh, President Macron said. So we we are uh, bracing for uh, new reactors. We are bracing for life extension. That won't actually come in the very short term. I mean, life extension is something that will change the trajectory between the uh, uh, 30s and, uh, and, and 40s, and the new reactors won't come in line before to 2035 at the very earliest. Yeah. So it's it's also a, a policy and a, a speech that um, drives us away from short-term priorities and from actions like sufficiency and renewables that could uh, deliver much, uh, much faster. And maybe the last point to, to note is that when he made that speech, uh, President Macron said that no expert thinks 100% renewables is possible in France. And he said that uh, although scenarios like the, the one by Negawatt show it is possible, but also official scenarios by RT, which is a grid, uh, the uh, electric grid operator, or ADEM, which is the uh, French uh, agency for uh, energy transition. I mean, they have, and they delivered 100% renewable scenarios to the uh, president, which was just on in denial of this uh, alternative. Well, it's, that's very interesting. I mean, you're kind of, you are drawing in, and this is, the, it's a very political hot potato here. And recently, at the beginning of this month, 
um, Macron kind of came under, um, well, came under criticism uh, because he chaired this uh, Council on Nuclear Policy on the 3rd <coughs> of February, and it caused a row with the opposition because there is a public debate, as we mentioned earlier, yeah. that is, um, you know, that is still ongoing, and uh, it, this is all on the future of France's energy and renewables and energy sustainability. But um, a colleague of yours who I was talking to said, oh, well, the government is undercutting debate, and this has been happening since the 1970s. So you are very involved in this public debate. Is it purely cosmetic for the government? Oh, yeah, it is. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's not new. Um, I um, often say that um, uh, French nuclear power is too weak to dare uh, committing to a real democratic debate, but too strong to have to do it. Um, and, I mean, we, we've seen that many times for decades, and we see it again, because the uh, reality is that, um, I mean, one year on, almost day to day after the president made, committed to that nuclear renaissance plan, and I mean, dreaming himself, obviously, as a kind of new de Gaulle, you know, starting a new program like in the 70s and, uh, and, and bringing back French greatness through, uh, 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 through uh, nuclear power. I mean, the reality is that, uh, I mean, everything is against mm. the, uh, the uh, success of such a plan because the industry is crippled, because renewables uh, enjoy a much better, a much stronger economic uh, and industrial dynamics because the uh, energy crisis brings sufficiency uh, on the agenda. So the president and the government have, are kind of struggling against time to make, to, to create fait accompli. Yes. And, and kind of stealing, steal, steal the future. So that comes with a, a bill in the parliament to yeah. accelerate uh, the uh, development of new nuclear plans. Yeah. It's a bureaucracy um, bill. Is that what, that's what they're calling it. It's just to facilitate the actual yes, speeding I mean, up it, of that. It, yeah. it won't actually uh, accelerate anything from a, a concrete perspective because, I mean, the time needed from, for engineering and, uh, and, 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 and detailed design and so on and building <clears throat> won't change. At least a but decade. It, it, it creates more. like administrative and political steps again to create uh, fait accompli. Then we had this um, uh, Council of Nuclear Policy, who took very uh, strong decisions, especially one which is uh, very, uh, very um, worrying to uh, like cut the uh, French Institute for uh, Radio Protection and, and Nuclear Safety into pieces and put the nuclear expertise under the control of the uh, French Nuclear uh, Safety Authority. So. Uh, getting back from the uh, old and very uh, crucial principle of separating um, the uh, evaluation and uh, decision making uh, for uh, for nuclear safety. So we we have this plan. We have uh, a project to take some of the uh, livrea mm -hmm. um, um, the savings. savings. Yes, the yeah, savings. like the, the the most popular French savings. Sure, I, I mean, to use part of it. Mm -hmm when it's normally uh, meant for, uh, for uh, social housing, to use part of it to finance new reactors. So the, the, the government is really trying to find every bit and pieces to make it more feasible against the reality and against time. And yes, it is killing the, new, the, 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 debate, the debate that we need when you think of the kind of commitment that it represents over one or more uh, century to yeah to 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 remain exposed to yeah. the risks that come with nuclear facilities. Uh, that, and that brings me to my next question. I mean, EDF, who are the, the French uh, electricity um, <coughs> provider, now it's all got to do with safety. I mean, they're working on building extra refrigerated pools. These are fuel cooling pools in a place called La Hague, which mm -hmm. is up in um, Normandy, up near um, uh, Cherbourg. Uh, it, and they said that like, at their, at, as it stands at the moment, they're almost at capacity and they reckon they could be saturated by the year 2030. Now, this is only seven years down the line. They're looking for over a billion of investments to make, create more pools. Now, when you think about pools, 
cooling pools before these things can be either disposed of or whatever. It, I mean, it really brings you back to the nightmare scenarios of the 1970s. I mean, what is the ecological impact of this? And like, is this just a signal that France is going to bulldoze its way through with nuclear energy anyway? <clears throat> well, um, first of all, uh, spent fuel pools mm. are possibly the, uh, the, the, the weakest point in uh, the whole uh, nuclear chain mm. when it comes to safety and the risk of major accident. A major accident on a pool like those in La Hague mm. could be far much worse than an accident even like we've seen in Chernobyl or Fukushima. So, mm. I mean, one has to have in mind the kind of, the kind of issue uh, at stake. Um, then, I mean... French nuclear policy has been based on uh, the kind of, a kind of myth of reusing nuclear materials through reprocessing, yeah. um, which means we shouldn't have uh, spent nuclear fuel piling up because it should be reprocessed and reused, and we shouldn't have um, reprocessed uranium and plutonium that arise from reprocessing piling up. The current situation is that we have spent nuclear fuel piling up, especially the, 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 the fuel that is called MOX fuel, MOX, and that yeah. comes from a first reuse and is uh, heavily uh, uh, charged in plutonium and uh, warmer and, uh, and, I mean, much, much more uh, problematic than um, the uh, initial fuel. So we have pools, uh, we have uh, a clear risk of saturation of the pools, we have reprocessed uranium piling up, and uh, this reprocessed uranium used to be sent in Russia exactly, to be yeah. reprocessed. I'm, so you can see the kind of geopolitical weakness that it. comes also with that policy. And plutonium is also piling up. I mean, we, when we started the policy of reusing plutonium, like uh, almost 40 years ago, I mean, our plutonium, our civilian plutonium stock was practically uh, nil. Mm. Uh, we know I have more than 80 tons um, and it raises by uh, at least one ton per year. Even though the policy is that we actually reuse as much as we uh, separate. And plutonium um, storage capacities are also saturated. So yeah. uh, the uh, French Safety Authority has just granted uh, uh, Orano, which is running the Lahad plant, uh, the right to start storing plutonium in some parts of the uh, of the plant that were not meant initially for such storage. So, I mean, the, the whole system is kind of running, to stand still, uh, running uh, <laughs> behind a, a myth mm. of complete recycling, but it it it, it cracks from everywhere. Well, this, I mean, I think it's 40% of France's reactors at the moment use MOX. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, EDF, um, on their uh, PR side, is saying, oh, no, no, we're still going to be able to send our spent fuel to Russia. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen very soon. So, I mean, the, the other thing is, um, I believe in eastern France, the, 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 the French, um, uh, or France, is considering this plan. It's called the CGO? Is that CGO, the, that's the, CGO the name plan. of the uh, plan for a yeah. geological disposal. Exactly. So it's putting it in a seam of clay that's over in uh, eastern France. Um, and, I mean, this is to put it... Underground, 500 meters, first and foremost, is that far, is that deep enough? Uh, but how do the local residents take to this as being a s singled out for, uh, for like, oh, well, this is where, this is going to be uh, uh, well, all part of our sustainability here? They, um, well, f first of all, I, I mean, I, I don't know if 500 meters is enough. I mean, it, 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 it's more a matter of the quality of the geological rocks to, 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 to maintain containment. Um, and I mean, we, we need that kind of option because I mean, the, the uh, nuclear waste we're talking about are highly radioactive and for a long time, which means uh, one needs to aim for so-called passive safety, which is a, a state in the long term when, uh, I mean, we, we can't escape the fact that at some point, we will forget and we will not 
manage this again yeah, uh, anymore. Yeah. Um, so passive safety is meant to keep it safe once we have forgotten. And I mean, th there's no better option to get the to get to that uh, level of safety than uh, hundreds of meters of uh, of uh, geological rock. But um, I mean, we we might find a way to make it feasible and safe from a from a technical perspective but it, it won't be from an ethical uh, ethical sorry, perspective, ethical yeah, perspective yeah, sure. anyway because i mean it's a burden that we transfer to future generation whatever happens i mean the pl the current plan for the existing reactors is that the waste the the, the last waste should get down by the by the middle of next century and if we start new reactors I mean, the plan will be to get down by uh, 2,200 something. Mm. Um, so, I mean, the local residents, I mean, they, they are faced with this burden uh, and they feel trapped because, I mean, they were promised in the beginning that it was only for research. They were promised in the beginning that there would be research in another site, in another kind of geological uh, uh, structure mm -hmm. that didn't happen. They were promised that uh, the government would commit to uh, reversibility, which means that, which was under understood at least as we could took the waste back and start a new project of another type in another place at any time. And that is not uh, what the what, it, what is prepared. So, yeah, local residents. I mean, on one hand, they are happy with the uh, economic uh, uh, income that comes uh, obviously with that uh, project. But on the other hand, they really feel trapped. And part of the uh, local population is uh, uh, is, uh, is struggling very hard, and, uh, and fighting, I mean, it, yeah. it, it's getting violent mm. uh, on the ground. Uh, against this uh, this plan, well, I mean, you just you've you've hit the nail on the head here that this is really something that the the, the government is looking that is going to be so long term. We're talking centuries that it will keep on being used and reused and reused. So, I mean, Eve, today I think we should try and wrap up our uh, conversation with a little bit of positive news. Um, I mean, you know, we're talking about nuclear, we're talking about the kind of the catch twenty two, and then these long processes, uh, which uh, obviously are going to have a massive impact on future generations, but. Again, you specialize in energy sufficiency. Now, it would appear, or would it appear, that the message um, is getting through um, to people about uh, being, you know, but, but, but the transition of energy and being sufficient with energy because we were warned about power outages and power cuts this winter. Um, but that never happened. So was that thanks to us for being good citizens? I mean, was that directly due to people consuming less energy and getting the big picture? Yeah. Well, uh well, one has to take into account that uh, it, it, it was a warm winter, which uh, obviously helps, uh, especially with the high level of dependency of uh, of uh, French electric consumption to uh, bad electric heating that is uh, very, uh, very, uh, very, um, very common in uh, in buildings. Um, there, there also, uh, I mean, part of the reduction, like. 10% reduction in, 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 in gas and electricity consumption. So that is something. Uh, part of the reduction, um, and, and that those 10% are taking into account uh, the uh, climate smoothness. Mm. Um, part of it came from an uh, from, um, uh, unchosen uh, sufficiency like you know, people not being able to uh, pay for the uh, energy bill anymore. But uh, there, there was also a clear s sign of positive sufficiency of people choosing to uh, turn uh, the heating a bit down, to uh, drive less when it comes to, to fuel, to, uh, to, to make small changes. Um, and I think this shows that when people understand that we are faced with a kind of structural crisis, be it the, uh, the uh, climate urgency, of course, but also uh, energy security, sovereignty uh, issues. Uh, when people understand that it is st a structural crisis, they understand the uh, interests uh, and the benefits from uh, sufficiency. And I think this, uh, like, 
short-term experience really showed that people are much more ready to changes in consumption patterns than uh, policymakers tend to think. Um, and yeah, w when talking to uh, people in the government or uh, administration, I often have the feeling that uh, they are much, I mean, they are lagging behind yeah. the uh, understanding by the population of the kind of systemic change that we need, that we could implement, and that would provide a lot of benefits. Interesting, interesting, interesting. The people are getting the message, but the politicians have yet to grasp it. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Yves Magnac, thank you very thank much you. Uh, for joining me on Power's Perspective today. And thank you for checking in with us here. And you can get all of our previous editions of Power's Perspective on rfienglish.com forward slash podcasts and indeed wherever you get your podcasts. For me, David Coffey, have a great day. We'll be back in two weeks' time.